trust in God, take care of the poor. Completely have trust in God, leave everything in His hands, and believe that His love will act for your own benefit. Then God will take care of everything because there is nothing He cannot do. Everything is easy for Him. The difficult thing is for man to decide to humble himself and leave everything to God's providence and love. Saint Paisio of Mount Athos. Bible verses of the day. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. He is like a tree planted beside the waters that stretch out its roots to the stream. He fears not the heat when it comes. Its leaves stay green in the year of drought. It shows no distress, but still bears fruit. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Trust in God. Care for the poor. From the reflections of Sister Mary Margaret Tepang, Breaking the Bread of the Word, series number 8. Like show 1, for first reading. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. Today's Old Testament reading presents a contrast between those who trust in human beings and those who trust in God, those who put their trust in mortals or like a barren bush in the desert. Nothing good ever happens to them. Those who put their hope in the Lord or like a tree growing near a stream, sending our roots to the water. Its leaves stay green and it keeps on bearing fruit. This study, in contrast, cuts across the heart of true religion. Man's sole refuge is God. The just trust in the Lord and their hope is in God. The human heart is devious and its secret plots are hidden to men. But everything is transparent to God. The Lord God, who probes the mind and searches the heart, rewards people according to their deeds. Jesus, the Son of God, likewise perceives the working of the heart in the interior sentiments of his disciples. The Lord Jesus recompenses us according to our deeds. The following two stories circulated through the internet illustrate a person's fundamental choice as well as the blessings and sacrifices that he entails. Story number one. Many years ago, Al Capone virtually owned Chicago. Capone wasn't famous for anything heroic. He was notorious for enmeshing the windy city in everything from bottle, leg, booze, and prostitution to murder. Capone had a lawyer nicknamed Easy Eddie. He was Capone's lawyer for a good reason. Eddie was very good. In fact, Eddie's skill at legal maneuvering kept Big L out of jail for a long time. To show his appreciation, Capone paid him very well. Not only was the money big, but Eddie got special dividends as well for instance. He and his family occupied a fencing mansion with live-in help and all or and all the conveniences of the day. The state was so large that it filled an entire Chicago city block. Eddie lived the high life of the Chicago mob and gave little consideration to the atrocity that went on around him. Eddie did have one soft spot. However, he had a son that he loved dearly. Eddie saw to it that his young son had clothes, cars, and a good education. Nothing was withheld. Price was no object. And despite his involvement with organized crime, Eddie even tried to teach to teach him right from wrong. Eddie 
wanted his son to be a better man than he was. Yet, with all his wealth and influence, there were two things he couldn't give his son. He couldn't pass on a good name or a good example. One day, Easy Eddie reached a difficult decision. Easy Eddie wanted to re rectify wrongs he had done. He decided he would go to the authorities to tell the truth about all about Al Scarface Capone, clean up his tarnished name and offer his son some semblance of integrity. To do this, he would have to testify against the mob, and he knew the cost that the cost would be great. So he testified. Within the year, Easy Eddie, Easy Eddie's life ended in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago street. But in his eyes, he had given his son the greatest gift he had to offer, at the greatest price he could ever pay. Police removed from his pocket a rosary, a crucifix, a religious medallion, and a poem clipped from a magazine. Story number two. World War II produces many heroes. One such man was Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hire. Oh, 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 he was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier Lex Lexington in the South Pacific. One day, his entire squadron was sent on a mission. After he was, he was airborne, he looked at his fuel gauge and realized that someone had forgotten to top off his fuel tank. He would not have enough fuel to complete his mission and get back to his ship. His flight leader told him to return to the carrier. Reluctantly, he dropped out of formation and headed back to the fleet. As he was returning to the mothership, he saw something that turned his blood cold. A squadron of Japanese aircraft was speeding its way toward the American fleet. Laying aside all thoughts of personal safety, he dove into the formation of Japanese planes. Wind mounted, 50 calibers blazed as he ch charged in attacking one surprise enemy plane and then another Butch wove in and out of the now broken formation and fire at as many planes as possible until all his ammunition was finally spent undaunted he continued the assault he dove at the planes, trying to clip a wing or tail in hopes of damaging as many enemy planes as possible, rendering them unfit to fly. Finally, the exasperated Japanese squadron took off in another direction, deeply relieved Butch O'Hire and his tattered fighter limped back to the carrier Upon arrival, he reported in and related the events surrounding his return. The film from the gun camera mounted on his plane told the tale. It showed the extent of Butch's daring attempt to protect his fleet. He had in fact destroyed five enemy aircrafts. This took place on February 20, 1942. And for that action, Butch became the Navy's first ace of World War II. But the first naval aviator to win the Medal of Honor a year later, Butch was killed in aerial combat at the age of 29. His hometown would not allow the memory of his World War II hero to fade. And today, O'Hare, I'm sorry, 
Airport in Chicago is named in tribute to the courage of this great man. So, what do these two stories have to do with each other? But Johar was Easy Eddie's son. Wow. Wow, wow. So can you imagine if he if Easy Eddie would have not done what he did? And look what the son did. Second reading. I love to read the missioner tales in Mary Knoll, the magazine of Mary Knoll missionaries. The July August 2004 issue contains an experience shared by Catherine Erisman, a Mary Knoll sister. Her story, which illustrates the compassionate attitude totally lacking in the rich man mentioned in today's gospel parable contains the hope that the pathetic Joseph to pour to buy toothpaste will have a better lot in heaven. I was making pastoral rounds at Bagando Hospital in Wansa, Tanzania, when a patient held my hand and made a request. Joseph, emaciated by AIDS, asked, could you please bring me some toothpaste, supplies like that or not, available in the hospital? So I brought him a tube I bought at the local store. When I stopped in to visit him the following day, I was told that Joseph had died. I pictured him standing before God with a stunning smile. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus containing today's gospel is to be seen against the backdrop of Jesus, desire to teach his disciples the right use of money through his powerful story. The divine master reinforces his teaching the wealth must be rightly used to give solace to the poor. The parable is an indictment against today's rich who do not care for the poor and whose callousness to the world's afflictions is such that it cannot be penetrated even if someone should rise from the dead. Verse 31. The final destiny of the saved and the lost in the afterlife is unalterable. In the afterlife, a reversal of fortune will take place. Those who were poor and destitute will be comforted. The chilling words of the condemn condemnation, however, will haunt the selfish, callous of heart. They who have been blind and deaf to the needs and agonizing cries of the poor. Meditation. Do, do we put trust in God? Do we care for the poor? What are we doing for the poor? And not just for the poor that do not have food, but also for the poor in spirit. For the for the the ones that live rich but or poor in their souls, what are we doing? Meditate on that prayer or ratio. Loving Father, give us the grace to listen to the cry of the poor. Let us always put our trust in you. Amen. Contemplation. The following is the bread of the living word that will nourish us throughout the day. Please memorize it. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 7. Action. Make a Lenten fast and offer the fruit of your sacrifice to feed the poor and hungry. In our fundamental option to serve the Lord, let us never rely on our own powers, but always acknowledge the love and grace of God who strengthen us for charitable deeds. And if you're fasting, um, it's a good idea 
that the money that you were going to spend on food, use it for the poor. And a lot of us have souls of our families that are suffering. The poor souls in purgatory need our prayers. How about, how about you go to your church and you offer masses for the souls in purgatory? This is one, one, um, just one idea. How about you go and feed the hungry? How about you give rosaries? You give out rosaries to the, and with a little pamphlet on how to pray the rosary to people that under the eyes of society are doing really well, but inside they are they are dying. They're the poorest persons. Those are just some suggestions. And I ha in the description box, I will leave a link to the book of a true hero under through my lens, St. Joseph. Father Donald Colloway wrote a book, and I have it. I have it in the description box so you can listen to it. As all of you know, I've been going through a recovery of a traumatic brain injury. And when I recorded that book, it's not the greatest reading, but I did it with lots of love. So it's there for you. You may also purchase the book and learn how to trust God like how St. Joseph did, how St. Padre Pio did. But the book the Father Donald Calloway wrote is about St. Joseph. So it's there for you. May the Lord bless you and those who you love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please pray for me as I continue to pray for you. And tomorrow we will talk about the sacrificial victim.